Welcome back to the Dire Straits cast, a podcast where I know exactly one song by the band The Dire Straits, Money for Nothing. And uh, Margaret, uh, I understand you you still know two know two songs one. by The Dire Straits. I do, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Salt and the uh, Swing. Excellent. Uh, so this is a news and mm-hmm. culture podcast about all of the the things going on in the Dire Straits world. Any any updates that you're aware of, Margaret? Uh, well, they don't need to make the guitar cry or sing. Okay. I've learned that much. Okay. How do we feel? Are they allowed to use that um, slur? Sing? Hmm? Cry? No, 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 no. In, in, in Money for Nothing. Oh. <laughs> you know, there's no accountability that I could ask mm-hmm, from, from the them. Dire Straits. I don't think there ever was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's what I would recommend they do. That's mm. that's where I'm going to go. My assumption that. is that everyone involved with that band died in 1989. Um, and I, yeah, yeah. I, I assume. They can't have lived past the... They why, certainly can't have outlived why, MTV. Why is this the thing you wanted to do? This is, this is, this is uh, Margaret and I's most beloved bit, the Dire Straits podcast by two people who know very little about the yeah. Dire Straits. Ma- Margaret, can you uh, confirm Because I only yes. know one song and Margaret knows two. Max. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've done it before, mm-hmm. so therefore yeah. it is our most beloved. Oh, okay. I was, I was, I've been waiting for weeks to talk about the Dire Straits again, um, <laughs> because you know after we did it the first time, I listened to Money for Nothing again because uh, I mostly had listened to a cover of it done by a bluegrass band, and it wound up, you know, that thing YouTube does where they like stick it in your like recently listened to thing, and so for the last like mm-hmm. several months, every time I hop on YouTube to put on music, <laughs> there's like a fifty percent chance I start playing that one song and then it 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 quickly takes me away from that to other songs and then in 30 minutes i'm singing hotel california um but you know and it's 4 30 in the morning morning. what else what are you gonna do anyway this concludes the dire straits cast uh if they're not dead don't tell us you know we're we're both fine with that (laughs) i i i i don't i don't unless you are listening and you are in dire straits in which case you have permission mm, to tell us. Especially if you will record us a custom version of either one of those two songs, but themed about, I don't know, whatever po- we do here, podcasting, I guess. That probably yeah. wouldn't be a very interesting song. Um, actually, you know what? I'm certain there is a deeply, deeply frustrating version of Money for Nothing that's about like podcasters making money as opposed to rock stars, and I don't want to hear it. So no, no thank you. Yep. That is the exception. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even if you're the Dire Straits people and you yeah. wrote that song, we don't want to <laughs> it. It would be very funny if the Dire Straits people were just like the Monster Mash guy where they just kept making as any time there was like a new group of people who like got a bunch of money, they do another <laughs> version of that. <laughs> Why are you still talking about this? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know, Sophie, because the, the um, rest of the story we're to talking say. about today which is the history of vagrancy and how it intertwines with the history of Benjamin Darling's descendants in, in Malaga Island. The rest of that story is very sad. Um, so that's yeah. why we're talking about the you Dire know, Straits but, cast. But legally, we are only allowed to feel joy when we're on Cool People Did Cool Stuff. Bastards, <laughs> bad time. Legal. Oh. We did sign that contract. Right. Well, great. I don't know. Sophie, see if we can get a deal with MTV and, and, and do a real music podcast. Are they still around? I think so. But it's just mm-hmm. like... It, now they're M-Pod for it, music pod. Oh God, that's be, sad. It just seems to be like more I like mean, spinoff shows of Jersey Shore. Mm-hmm. Over and over again. Yeah. Uh, that's... What a tragic state of affairs. Um, hey, that, I guess was, not tragic. that was a cultural moment. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, <laughs> like the Jersey Shore people probably committed fewer sex crimes than the musicians that were previously the draw to that channel. So I don't know. I don't know. Where I don't I'm going know. With it's, this. It probably seems true. probably pretty uh, <laughs> equal. Well, uh, now I've made our fun bit about the Dire Straits just as and depressing. And we're back, baby, as, behind as the, regular the show. So, so yeah, let's two. continue on. So <laughs> when we left our our friends on Malaga Island, um, things were still going pretty well there. But um, the 20th century was mm-hmm. starting to turn and there were problems on the horizon, right? You know, this kind of anti-vagrant hy- hysteria um, had sort of fed into, you know, the, this kind of local culture 
um, demonizing this this one, you know, dude, you know, li- squatting alone on an island. And it was kind of like a sign of, mm-hmm. uh, of things that are about to start becoming a problem for more of the people who live on these islands. Um, because the the kind of pleasant state of, of being ignored that had benefited these people for so many generations um, was going to come to an end because of the development of Maine's first tourist industry. Suddenly, Americans with disposable income were flocking to the main coast every summer. Um, these isolated islands, you know, with the additional technology that existed, were now less isolated. Um, and, you know, for a while, uh, about a century or so, affluent white Mainers had been pretty happy to leave the people of the Casco Bay Islands alone, um, especially since they were both an exit valve for folks who didn't fit into, like, Portland society, and they were a source of cheap labor. Yeah. But now they were starting to think, well, maybe there's more money if we just kind of eminent domain those islands and put up summer houses on them uh, for, you know, rich people and oh, shit. Yeah. Cool. What if we Airbnb their, 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 their community? For. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's basically what's happening. So Great. since there's money to be made in the islands now, local businesses start leaning on the local media to portray the Malagaites and their neighbors as an eyesore and a shame to the community. In 1899, a columnist for the Bath Enterprise lamented that, quote, Few people of Phippsburg had faith that the effort to get rid of Malaga with its burden of poor people would be successful. A flurry of local news articles like this one from the Casco Bay Breeze in 1905 described Malaga as the home of southern Negro blood and an incongruous scene on a spot of natural beauty. In 1908, the popular liberal standby Harper's Magazine sent a correspondent, Holman Day, and a photographer out to Malaga and several neighboring islands to do an article on the communities that had caused such a sudden panic to their longtime neighbors. The piece, titled The Queer Folk of the Maine Coast, is a fascinating historical document. (laughs) Um, And it uses the word queer more than any other document not about, like, queer people that I've ever seen. It is every third word in this. so well, that just brings us back to money for nothing. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Does Holman Day get a pass? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't like this. Although I, it, I have such a mixed feeling about this because Day comes across mm. as like a very like up his own ass, like liberal elite asshole looking down on these people and kind of like cheerfully condescending them. But also he is competent as a reporter. He is going and talk and he's like the only one who does. And so a huge amount of what we know about the culture okay. of these islands is just because he went and talked to people and gave deliver their stories. So it is one of those like kind of the way he does it is frustrating, but he does provide us with okay. an absolutely. It's kind of like you got that guy in like the White House press corps, the one guy who cared about AIDS and like he's like like dropping some, you know, slurs and laughing uh, about it sometimes. But he also is pushing. Yeah. He's the only guy pushing the Reagan administration about the fact that people are dying. And this is a serious problem. So, like, you know, journalism, <laughs> you, it's you get a lot of these stories there yeah. where it's like this is fucked up. But also yeah. this is the only reason we know about these people. So I don't know. I don't know what to it, we're morally to put that. It doesn't really matter. I guess it happened. Yeah. morally it goes in the past yeah, it's, it's that the is the past. category it's a thing of that happened. <laughs> um so holman yeah. day's article opens promisingly enough with the lines of old muskets drove the abnakis off the coast of maine today money is driving away another race which could be like a good opening if you're trying to be like you know the cruelty yeah. of settlers against the indigenous people is being replicated uh by capitalists against these folks who have found refuge here um that is a little bit of what he means but not not i, I don't think he really analyzes things in that context you know um okay he continues between kittery point and quotey head resorters have acquired hundreds of headlands and thousands of islands a phalanx of cottages fronts the sea the queer squatter people who have been dispossessed find little relish in being stared at as human curiosities. So the queer folk live alone, and it is said that isolation develops eccentricity. The ocean creeps to the doors of their huts, and winter waves thunder in their ears, and there are those who say that the din of the sea boats beats curious ideas into their head. So for one thing, 
this rules. It's, They're just cool as hell. They are so cool. Even though this guy sounds like Lovecraft. He does. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Is he sounds like H, like the madness is creeping in from the ocean waves, battering yeah. their their simple brains. Um, it is interesting yeah. that he like he starts with like almost almost like actual class analysis here, talking about like a real yeah. like the the kind of like. Uh, uh, longitudinal problems between the genocide of the native peoples of this isle and kind of the the relentless hunger that that uh, you know the the quest for profit brings and how it just inherently dispossesses and forces people out of their homes. Um, but he immediately moves to like, and these folks believe weird shit. Like that's the focus of the article is yeah. how silly they are. So he he, yeah. he acknowledges that problem and then drops it right away, like a paragraph into this fucking <laughs> article. <laughs> um, that. That said, Holman Day is a pretty textbook, earnest, white, liberal intellectual. That's at least the picture one gets mm-hmm. of. I haven't read his entire oeuvre. Uh, that's the picture that you get of this guy in this article. Um, he paints a pretty desperate picture of the educational standards and general culture, which, as we've already said, is not accurate. These people seem to have been, and this is something that like modern day uh, archaeologists will note, seem to have been pretty like reasonably well educated by the standards of the day and the area. Um, Day uses a lot of noble savage imagery here, too, uh, in lines like this, quote, They are not envious. They do not want to beg. Where penury and pride meet in the city, there are heart burnings. But the man tossing in the battered dory in the swash of a millionaire's yacht neither sighs nor glares, provided he be one of the queer folk. For the queer folk are queer in one respect (laughs) especially. They dwell content in their own world, which is often a world of illusion. For solitariness and the sea breeds strange (laughs) thoughts. (laughs) He keeps keeps going back to that uh this guy is jealous it is, it is. he's like he's like this reporter is living jealous. some dog shit life back in the city watching all of his friends get cholera yeah. every season and like what yeah. do i have on these people well some of them believe silly stuff um holman really yeah. wanted to make sure people got the picture that these people were sweet but deranged and thus not capable of taking care of themselves in the ways that we modern americans expect now to his mm. credit holman travels pretty widely ar- around the islands and he comes across people with legitimately fascinating stories that i wish desperately had been investigated by a proper anthropologist although those didn't really exist back then um but yeah, yeah it's it's enticing The bits that he gives us. One of the stories he tells us is about a guy named Ossian Dustin. Ossian lives on an island called Newcastle, not far away from Malaga. And when Holman meets him, Ossian Dustin is 80 years old. Um, He survives mostly off of just kind of like pulling what he can out of the ocean. He makes about $50 a year -hmm. doing odd jobs for people back on shore, mostly firewood sawing. And this pittance is enough for him to remain alone and independent on the island, engaging in his life's goal hunting for Captain K- Kid's treasure. That is his entire, this man has spent, hell yeah, fucking yeah. rad dude. He spent his whole life living alone on this island, hunting for Captain Kid's treasure. Quote, the buried existence of which he implicitly believes. Now, what this guy represents in actuality is a dude who was born in around the early 1820s and seems to have decided, like, taken a look at American society in the 1820s and been like, nah, fuck that shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and he is he has this kind of comfortable <laughs> fantasy about Captain Hood, Hood uh, Kid's treasure that gives him like purpose and and a sense of like meaning uh, and seems to make him pretty happy. As far as we can gather from Holman's reporting, he came to believe that Kid's treasure was hidden in the area due to a local legend he encountered as a young man, and he just decided to spend his entire life trying to find it. Holman describes this as, quote, the type of content that relieves these hidden human tragedies of some of their pitifulness, right? Well, this guy's so happy, it makes it less sad (laughs) that he lives this depressing life. He's like, the life's only depressing to you, Holman. Like, this guy's doing fine. (laughs) He is hunting for buried treasure. He is probably friends with seagulls. Like, his life is great. He is 80 years old. Nobody lives that long. Like, whatever he's doing is working well yeah. for him <laughs> like, yeah here's holman again <laughs> he has toiled nights for the most part believing that in the night a treasure seeker can best circumvent the enchantments laid on buried pirate spoils he searches with a treasure rod made by his own hands he has the tip of a cow's horn plugged with wood and containing various metals in the wooden plug are stuck parallel strips of whalebone and he clutches these strips one in each hand and walks along balancing the tip of the horn when he passes over the famous iron pot the tip thus is his belief will turn down 
down and point at the buried treasure. He said his he says his spade has struck the iron pot several times, but that enchantment has whisked away the treasure. He expects that eventually his own charms oh, will no. prevail over the power of evil. <laughs> that's a cool Hell that's yeah. a fine life. I'm sorry. Like that's a perfectly I fine know. existence. <laughs> he gets his steps in every day, mm -hmm. like whatever. He has built a whole like almost religious mythology around this treasure that allows him to always be searching yeah. for it but never quite finding it while still getting little victories along the way. What's wrong with this life? In the grand yeah. scheme of things, how can yeah. you have a problem with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> I bring this guy up both because this is an amazing story and it made me so happy to read and also because it's evidence of what these islands were. They were a refuge, not just for people like the Darlings and their descendants whose very relationships are criminal, but for folks, I think it's fair to say mm -hmm. whatever is going on with Aussie and Dustin, he's not what you'd call neurotypical, right? Um, he is someone yeah. who has like built this kind of religious cosmology around the search for this treasure. He has visions that he talks about regularly of a figure in shining gold guiding him along. And in most of the rest of the country, a man who said these things and did these things would have been forced into a sanitarium where he would have fucking died of cholera right that's this guy's yep. story 99 percent of the u.s yep. is he is imprisoned and left to die of disease but instead he's 80 years old <laughs> you know and and yep. Ho and holman is absolute like repeatedly mentions he's the happiest one of the happiest men that he's ever met right like this guy yep. has has built a life for himself which is a pretty awesome achievement and holman is human enough to recognize that he's witnessing something remarkable while at the same time rejecting this man's beliefs as worth any thought Quote, it can scarcely be said that Uncle Ossian's unfailing cheerfulness springs from any philosophy of life that he has evolved. But after our talk, I came out of his dingy hut with the feeling that probably some of the proud folk in the cottages down the bay needed pity more than he. So he's like, wow, this guy seems yeah. deeply happy and has lived to an advanced age, but there's probably nothing worth studying and like his approach to life. <laughs> I don't know, man. He's not rich. Yeah, he's not even have money. I don't yeah. know, man. Maybe he figured something yeah. out that most of us never do. Uh, he, yeah, he seems fine. I don't know. Maybe he found the gold a year yeah. after him. Maybe the he cottages. did. Yeah, maybe he did. <laughs> um, so again, Holman here is kind of on the edge of a revelation that his journey through these islands makes crystal clear, which is that civilization is not an unalloyed good, and many marginalized people have always been able to take care of themselves better by dropping out of it. That has been a fact of, of history for as long yeah. as people have been like building cities and making rules, is that some people, particularly those persecuted society, are better off without them. Uh, next, Holman visits Spruce Island, inhabited solely by three elderly men, the Shanks brothers, William, Daniel, and Nehemiah. They had lived all their lives in what he describes as a tumble-down shelter. William and Daniel never married, but Nehemiah had what our writer buddy patronizingly calls a poor little romance that broke his heart. Basically, Nehemiah and Aww. their dad used to go to Portland to sell their fish catch. And at one point, this lady married him as a con to take his money, family savings away, um, which is Aww. sad. Uh, their father forgave Nehemiah by tasking him to watch over his brothers for the rest of their lives. It kind of seems, again, like his brothers at least are... That sounds like a myth that you're telling. Well, I mean, this is... That's amazing. He met these people. It, basically, what it's... Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. I believe it. It's just, I think that... It's like the, his actual life has elements mm -hmm. that are mythic storytelling. Yeah. Like, ah, you have done, you have failed in this way by being tricked. Now you have a new task. Yeah. And it, it does, it you does. Know? That is kind of it's what's cool. happening. Cause like William and Daniel, it seems like are again, what you would say, not neurotypical, right? Um, they are, yeah. they are not people who can live. Nehemiah probably could have, these are not people who can live exist in the regular society of the time their dad realizes that and he's like look yeah you've got to take care of them because this is the only place that they're ever going to have um and so that's yeah. what nehemiah these guys are all like i think in their 60s 70s uh when holman meets them um and it, it's 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 an intro a remarkable story as you've noted and it 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 gets kind of more fascinating to me there's a there's a paragraph in here about William in particular that I have not been able to get out of my head since I read it. 
For more than 20 years, William has never come out of the hut into the sunshine. He told me that he feared the sun might heat his brains and interfere with his life work, which is the composition of poetry. There is a bra- blanket slung across one end of the hut. William sits behind his bl- this blanket and fixes his eyes on the sunlight that enters through a knothole and composes. He states that he is now the author of a thousand pieces. None of which he ever writes down. He just, his entire life is sitting in that chair, filling his his brain with his own poetry that no one else will ever hear. That's, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's like, huh. Yeah. It's like the anchorites, the people who would like go and like wall themselves up. Yeah. Like, anyway. Yeah, and I honestly, you know, if Holman was a better journalist, the thing to do would be like, would you read me some poems <laughs> like so I can write them down? Yeah, totally. Like, I want to know what this <laughs> yeah. guy, like, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, he's either like, he's probably the best or worst poet <laughs> yeah, who's just ever dog lived, shit. You know? <laughs> Absolute trash verse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, either way, that's, there's like a, a, a deep kind of harrowing beauty in that that simple statement about yeah. this guy's life. Um, anyway, when I started researching this, my thinking was again, that I would start with the tale of Benjamin Darling and then Malaga and how it became a haven for these kind of like these people who had, who couldn't live in regular society or chose not to and built this resilient culture of mm-hmm. their own and how that culture was destroyed in the name of progress. But for all of my issues with Holman's smugness uh, and dismissal of the depth of inner life lived by his subjects, I must admit that the substantial footwork he did is what keyed me into the deeper story here because the people he's describing a lot of these folks you look at a guy like Ossian right you look at uh, people like these brothers Mm -hmm. these are folks who today would probably be living on the street right you know if they don't have family support if they don't have like some access to funding a lot like these are people who cannot fit in with capitalism right you know they can do like some odd jobs and stuff here but they're never going to like buy a house in a city they're never going to like own anything that they have a deed for that's like not for most of these people not the kind of people that they are and while there was this place where they could go and be outside of the law and free a lot of them lived okay lives based on the standards of the time, you know, verging on a lot better lives than many of the people back on land would have lived. Um, not that they were easy yeah. lives, but they were lives. And that's not an option for people like this anymore. It was just, there's no outside anymore is like yeah. one of the things that, you know, there's no, yeah, it's not like any, you know, the quote unquote places that aren't owned, you know, by somebody who can lock you out or owned by the city who can make a law saying it's illegal to camp there or whatever. Um, yeah. So this is a story about how that happened and about how these anti vagrancy laws that primarily got instituted in order to police the behavior of newly free black Americans um, kind of coincided with the disgust of moneyed people in cities against the folks who had managed to build a life outside of them. Um, That's that's what we're talking about. But you know what we're talking about first, Margaret? What's that? Ads for products. Wait, why are there there's advertisers on this there show? sure are uh there sure are all of whom i i don't i don't know i don't know i'm kind of I'm kind of bumming out right now so uh we're just we're just gonna throw to ads i don't have a joke uh here you go ah we're back um you know Good, good stuff. We're, we're feeling happy. Everybody's having a good time and on a, a solid emotional level. So. Yay. Anyway, I'm having a good time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's cool. And obviously, like, you know, the fact that these islands were available for this descendants of the darlings and all these other people is partly a result of the ongoing genocide against the indigenous peoples uh, who had inhabited them before. Yeah. But, you know. Benjamin Darling didn't have a choice about being here, right? Like, I don't, I don't, I, I, can't, I don't put that on them that like, well, shit, there's nobody here. And like the folks in those cities suck ass. Let's get the fuck out of here. You know, yep. like uh, w- yeah. what, what else are they going to do? Right. Um, so as I write this uh, in Portland, Oregon, uh, the mayor, Ted Wheeler, is working to uh, has actually I, I when I wrote this, he was still building support for it. But the vote just passed to ban camping, as he calls it, during daylight hours on 
city property. This includes the parks and green spaces that tend to be preferred by the kind of folks who find themselves living in encampments. And of course, these laws are not meant to criminalize the kind of camping that like affluent white people do where they like go out to, you yeah. know, camp to feel connected to nature. What they're trying to criminalize is the existence of people who cannot afford rent or a house, um, who they don't really care where these people end up. A camp, like a concentration camp, is is kind of the thing that Ted Wheeler is floating, is like t- actively trying to build support for, is like enforced camps where people are checked when they enter and leave and have like their their hours restricted and are searched when they when they come in. Like that is the goal. Um, I think the real goal would be just to like force them to move somewhere else. Like people used to bus their homeless folks to California. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's it is kind of one of the things that I'm frustrated by is sort of the patronizing mockery of describing these people as as like camping. Um, you know, like the, these are their homes, this is the lives that they've built for themselves. Um, it's kind of like describing the people of Malaga or whatever as like hermits living in caves, where it's like, no, I mean they have they have structures that they built, they have houses, like they're just they're, they're living the life yeah. that they are able to live. Like you don't have to be a dick about it. You couldn't you couldn't hack it out there um so from time to time folks put out in this way attempt to construct more elaborate structures for themselves in order to survive um a lot of this makes me think about the kind of communities that that build up on these islands in malaga um and they make me think when i was reading about and yeah. looking at some of the photos of the houses there i was brought back to a story of a guy outside of portland uh named mikey who in november of 2020 built a two-story wooden home for himself off airport way um, Uh, This immediately became like a huge there was a bunch of different like conservative news stories and stuff that like fucking covered this Um, kind of a representative example is on a Babylon Bee affiliated website written by an author who gives his name as the ghost of Reagan titled this Portland homeless man's (laughs) house is fancier than your home. Um, It's interesting, like when he was interviewed by local media, he was like, I needed somewhere to live and I hate tents. So I like built myself a house and of of course the city finds out yeah. it like pisses off all these right wingers mikey gets forced out of his home which is demolished um you know i love that that they're pre- gonna present this man as lazy yeah you know mm-hmm. this this unindustrious man <laughs> who has built a two-story where's home. the third story there's not even a basement <laughs> yeah <laughs> um And it is like, you know, when you're talking about sort of some of the problems of encampments and stuff, you know, I live near several of them. Um, You and I just went and put out Mm -hmm. a fire at one the other day. Now, in that case, I think it was a fire started by there's some local kids um, who like to attack homeless people. I believe it was them lighting some of their shit on fire. Um, because it seems yeah, to be seems random, likely. you know, that said stuff like that. I, I talk to people who live there. Sometimes it's like one group has beef with another and like their shit gets lit on fire. There's also like fires happen in these encampments because of, uh, improperly, um, you know, handled like uh, propane stoves and stuff. There are problems mm-hmm. that need to be dealt with and in some cases even it like especially during fire season you may have to say like hey guys we can't have a bunch of fucking propane burners out here it's going to cause like a serious problem for a lot of people i'm not saying like there shouldn't be any kind of like attention paid to what people do if they decide to set up homes for themselves on like you know city property or whatever i just don't think the default should be destroying everything they have and putting them in jail um like you know there's all this it's also this like yeah i just I, I i can't quite wrap my head around the kind of person who thinks that criminalizing homelessness is a good idea because part of it is like well but that could just be you yeah right like that could just like the the crime is that they had a series of bad events and you just assume that your life will never include bad events. Like what life have you led where you don't have bad events? Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to even phrase it. It just makes no sense to me. And there's, and there's like a lot of options that are not like, obviously there's a lot of safety reasons why. Yeah. Maybe we can't just have people setting up wherever they want to. Like for example, like in the West during sure. fire season, that presents, presents a danger. Right. I spent a decent amount of time back in 2015 in a place called Nicholsville, which is one of a couple of Nicholsvilles that have existed in Seattle, which was like empty land that local homeless people started building tiny homes in, um, fairly well mm-hmm. constructed, safe. Uh, they were able to get like trash pickup and stuff. Um, and as a result, it was like cool. a decent, safe play. I mean, eventually 
they got forced out. It's happened a couple of times. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. you know, one of the things that's kind of neat is that there have also been like kind of the attention that this got helped build support in Seattle um, for local and governments to embrace some ideas that kind of offer more dignity on autonomy to houseless regiments like Nicholsville. Um, and so there have been we've yeah. seen the creation of more kind of like tiny home villages made from recycled materials and stuff where people kind of have more autonomy and are involved in the project of like helping to craft their own living spaces. Um, these are not perfect. These projects are generally, when they're legal, are conducted under the strict eye of the city. Um, this sometimes means that some of them have like mandatory searches for drugs or strict limits on what pets are available. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, better, you know, certainly than a lot of options that exist. Uh, I do find it frustrating that when homeless people build their own communities on undeveloped land, rather than being given access to services that might allow them to do this safely and hygienically, they're more often forced violently out of their homes at greater expense than it would be yeah. to provide them with services because um, it's not cheap yeah. to actually do all this. Um, when cities do give these people the opportunity to exist in a place where they can build some sort of comfort for themselves, the reactions from neighbors are often vicious. And I want to quote from a 2017 article in Crosscut about a Seattle community called Nicholsville uh, in Ballard. This is a couple of years after, I think it's from a different location from the one I went to. Quote, the plan to build one of the camps near residences and in the middle of businesses on the west end of Ballard's Market Street drew frustration mm -hmm. and angry objections, including from the Ballard Chamber of Commerce. When the news report uh, was reported on my Ballard, it garnered nearly 100 comments. Reasonable voices were drowned out by the aggressive rhetoric of some commenters. The real brilliance put them between a liquor store and a bar. Brilliant thinking. Better yet, let's put him right at the gateway of a historic treasure like the Locks, one of our most visited sites, wrote one commenter on My Ballard. Another compared the encampment to an episode <laughs> of The Walking Dead, claiming the area would no doubt go to total oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Yeah. That means that person's thinking about machine gunning them. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah. And it's like, there's this outrage people have, not just when like homeless people build something for themselves, but when they do it in a place where like they have a nice view. Um, there was an article yeah. that went viral in Portland in April, um, and I'm going to quote from the Fox coverage of this. Residents living near Portland's Willamette River have witnessed a series of homeless cabins and structures being built on prime river real estate with million dollar city views, but have so far been unable to get anyone to do anything about it. Pretty much everyone comes back and says they don't have jurisdiction because it's Union Pacific. It's a railroad. Rick Scaramella, who owns a condominium on the other side of the Willamette River, told KOIN on a report uh, in a report Thursday. I hate when you do this voice. I hate it too. It Scaramella <laughs> told the outlet that people from across the river, uh, across the river from his home, have been building makeshift cabins, complete with doors, windows, and sometimes even solar panels on the banks of the river that feature views of downtown Portland. Rick, fuck you. I How fucking dare I they. hope you step on a nail and get tetanus that costs you your leg. Uh, that's what I hope for you, Rick Scaramella. <laughs> um, you fucking condo owning piece of shit. Like they've got a nice view and they didn't pay what I paid yeah. for it. I don't know. Suck my dick, Rick. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I um I lived a I've, I've been a squatter in a lot of different cities at various points, and I remember. And one, I think that the way the Netherlands used to handle it until they changed the laws yeah. is brilliant, which is. A lot of people were suddenly houseless in the late 80s. The ladies. Uh, I'm going to have the timeline of this a little bit wrong. Yeah, the ladies. And, um, and so eventually everyone just started squatting all of these buildings and it became this ma massive thing. And eventually they got the law changed where if a building was left vacant for a year with no clear plan of what was going to happen to it, it was legal for people to squat it. And so you don't have real estate prospectors holding properties empty while people need houses yeah. because pe if you leave it empty someone's going to move in and mm -hmm. then you're fucked as the landowner or yeah. whatever and so it it got people to lower rents it got people to sell properties to families it got and it provided squatters places to live and i remember i had this moment i was i was playing accordion on the street with one of my squatter friends next to me and and this person comes up and asks my my friend you know, why does that accordion player play such sad music? And the actual answer is that I'm a goth and I like sad music. Yeah. But the the answer that my squatter friend had was like, oh, it's because we're squatters. We spend all of our time building things and then they come and they take them away. Um, and I just, I think about that where it's like, there's this 
version of the squatter where they're like they shit everywhere and they live in absolute horror to everything but then when people are like okay i'm gonna build a cabin i'm gonna put solar panels on it i'm gonna like get the trash taken out i'm gonna like try and do this right yeah people get even angrier because they want people living in squalor because they want people to suffer because they're bad people. Yeah. It's the like, anyway. you know, again, I spend a lot of time in and around encampments. I'm like friendly with one of the reasons why I'm friendly with folks is that like a year or so ago, a, a woman I lived with who has had an infant child at the time, uh, mm-hmm. was like going along this area and got shot at by kids on very nice new motorbikes with BB guns. And like some of the local yeah. homeless folks like rallied to her defense and were like, yeah, they come and like shoot at us all the time. It's just like a thing shitty rich kids do. And, uh, you know, yeah. I've gotten to know folks and stuff and it's you see like, yeah, the tr- I don't like that there's trash out there. I don't like that there's piles of trash in a nice natural area. That's yeah. not nice. You know where there would be big piles of trash if I th- it is my house, if I didn't have access to like city trash pickup, you know, yeah. like this is an option yeah, totally. and it's cheaper than letting it all build up and then hiring professionals to come and deal with it. Like they don't want to live in trash. Like anyway, yeah. there's solutions to this that aren't sending the fucking cops and the fucking biohazard trucks yeah. every like two or three times a year to fuck with people's stuff you know uh, yeah. it's I, I i i find the discourse around this all very frustrating which is why this episode got written so <clears throat> yeah let's go back to malaga island um so in 1908, uh, you know, The Walking Dead was still a couple years away from from being on television. Uh, but Holman Day's description of the community isn't much more generous than that uh, that fear mongering bullshit we heard a little earlier. <laughs> As a no man's land, Malaga has more striking peculiarities than any other island along shore. There are about 50 persons on it of all grade, all of grades of Negro blood, and most of them descendants of a runaway slave who came and hid here more years ago than any man about there remembers. These pe- That's Benjamin Darling he's talking about. These yeah. people form a strange clan. They have married and intermarried until the trespass on con- consanguinality has mm, until the trespass on consanguinality has, re- has produced its usual lamentable effect. Effects. They are as near to being children of nature as it is possible for people to be who are only a stone's throw away <laughs> from the mainland and civilization. They lack entirely the spirit of thrift and of providing for future emergencies. Winter after winter, through all the years, they have shivered and starved. But never does November find a woodpile on Malaga, nor a weak supply of food in reserve. To counsel on economy and to preachment on thrift, they are as inattentive as little children would be. A coast missionary took in hand, one especially improvident family of six, father, mother, and four children well grown. Spurred by him, they fished, dug clams, sold bait to trawlers, and at the end of the summer had saved about $70 among them. Then the missionary went away, confident that at least one Malaga family would reach March Hill in comparative comfort. When his back was turned, they used for kindlings the shingles that he had given them for the repair of their miserable hut, bought six dogs in order that each member of the family could have his own pet, and spent the rest of the money for sweets, pickles, jellies, and fancy groceries. He's literally being like, these poor people are buying nice food. (laughs) They have pets. I also love, like, he is full of shit here. Like, everything he says about them, like, not being able to store food. They don't know how to survive the winter. They don't, like, you know, like. Yeah, they're 80. I mean, among other things, like, he's like, their children are well-grown and healthy. Where it's like, how do they get that way, Holman? Did it just happen by accident before this minister showed up? Or were they actually capable of taking care of themselves? We know, again, from recent archaeology that local children were reasonably well educated by the standards of the time. Uh, And the fact that this community survived more than half a century, or more like about a century, doesn't really suggest people who were incapable of planning for the future or storing food. Archivist Kate McBrien, who curated an exhibition about Malaga for the Maine State Museum, notes the documentary and archaeological evidence refutes all of these myths. The people of Malaga Island lived just like their neighbors on the mainland. Again, we have evidence of how these yeah. people lived and it was not in like shocking desperation. And Holman's article includes photographs that don't agree with the statements in his article. The only extant <laughs> visual evidence in Malaga of Malaga in these days shows well-dressed women in what appear to be competently constructed homes. Like here's, and you know, this is like, there are some mission, there's like a missionary family on the Island who seemed like they were pretty mm-hmm. chill, but like these homes are older than them showing up. Like Sophie, if you'll show Margaret the picture, like these are, these are not, not like tumble down shacks like these are well seem to be pretty well constructed homes with like shingles and shit like you can see them 
Like in the article where he's oh, talking yeah. about like these are competently built homes. I don't know what he's yeah. fucking talking they about. They burned all the shingles yeah. except for the ones except that are on the roof. all the shingles you can see. Um, and the siding. Yeah. There's a lot of good use of shingles <laughs> yeah. here. And then the house in the background is even more like the house in the yeah. background looks There's as a fucking well. chimney my house. there. It's nice. Yes. It's fine. Yeah. They were doing okay. Plenty of windows. A lot of. Yeah. Yeah. And windows is like. When you're building a house on the cheap, yeah. windows is like the crazy expensive part, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. They got fucking glass and stuff, you know? They're clearly like, yeah. again, interfacing with mainstream society to some extent to get stuff yeah. that they can't, you can't make, you're, you're not going to have like build a glacier in some island off the coast of Maine. Um, yeah. So they get what they need. Is mul- you know? There's multiple, uh, multiple gables in that house in the back, right? Yeah. Like that's not even just like. Like that is fancier than if I went yeah. out and built a house I would build, you know? Yeah, they're like, you yeah. know, it's the fine. Um, I find this all particularly yeah. fascinating in light of how differently Holman describes another one of these communities, Loud's Island. Now, mm-hmm. we don't have information on like what the specific racial makeup, make, uh, makeup of Loud's Island was, but my assumption is that they were mostly white. And my assumption that they is that they were mostly white because Holman does not describe them as black or mixed race. And he does that every single yeah. time he writes about Malaga. So again, these yeah. are two islands like a mile from each other, something like that. Um, here's how he describes Loud's Island. And I'm going to see if you can pick up on the slant in his coverage at all. It has okay. a considerable okay. population of thrifty fishermen and farmers. They live in good houses and are intelligent. They and their ancestors have dwelt here for more than 150 years. But the men of the island have never voted in any election, towns, or state or national. They have never paid any state, town, or county taxes. They resisted the draft at the time of the Civil War and drove the officers off the island with clubs and rocks. They say they do not need the protecting arm of state or national government. They raise money for schools and roads, elect municipal officers to administer a affairs and seem to get along very comfortably like the malag is doing the so same thing the same yeah, thing, it's the same yeah. thing. <laughs> they've got their own little thing going on and they don't trust the government like just like these other people but one of them get uh-huh. described as like thrifty pioneers and the other are like <laughs> dangerous savage or not dangerous he doesn't describe them as yeah. dangerous i'll give him that but they like, live close yeah, to nature close they're to nature, basically right. animals exactly yeah so yeah. Holman paints a picture of the Malagaites as all but incapable of work because of their childlike nature. The fact that he describes them as harmless does not make this less toxic. Uh, and we know that his assessment was, again, inaccurate. By the early 1900s, many Malagaites worked ashore at resorts like the New Meadows Inn. From a 1980 article in Down East magazine, quote, their ragtag island neighbors, some white, some black, many of mixed blood, living in make do uh, dwellings, became an embarrassing eyesore to both local and uh, summer and year-round residents. There was a belief, too, made popular by several widely read, even sensational sociology studies of the time, that poverty, crime, and mental retardation stemmed directly from retrograde families, and that removing such decaying <laughs> stock would improve the moral fiber of society. Oh, God. In 1908... The half-step from here to Nazis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exa- we are right on the road. This is right when eugenics is starting up. Like, it all is cooking together, yeah. right? This is all... You're putting putting more stuff in the pot, right? You know, now you got a stew going, yeah. right? Now you got a, a real racism yeah. stew going. Um, <laughs> so in 1908, the same year as Holman Day's Harper's article, Maine established a school for the feeble-minded, later renamed the Pineland Center. This was a prison where poor unfortunates would be removed from public site, basically, right? Uh, This happened as the media campaign Mm. against the islanders reached a fever pitch, and the people who lived on the mainland grew horrified that the bad press about these islanders might rub off on them and damage their reputations to, like, folks in New York. They might think everyone in Maine was, like, a savage, right? Like, that's a big part of why they take action. Mm -hmm. Now, by the standards of a lot of these articles, I will say Holman's piece positively shines. And to provide an example of that, I'm going to read a quote from an article in the Casco Bay Breed from 1905. This is them talking about the Malagaites. They drank tea, spelled with a capital, if you please, for if reports be true, its strength would sink a ship. Tobacco is their ambrosia, (laughs) and it said they would almost sell their souls for a cut. A superstitious race are they on Malaga. Even the screeching of an owl is an ominous sign for them. And then the author goes on to suggest that these people (laughs) should be removed from their homes so that summer houses can be built upon the island. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hope that cool. guy died badly. Great. Um, from 1910 yeah. on, the state began pumping more and more resources into Malaga in the form of aid. And again, this is one of the justifications is they're like, look at all this chair. Look at all the public aid money they're taking. All of like the welfare money that they're taking, which like mm-hmm. they basically got none up until the early 1900s when suddenly it starts being like pushed into the island by the state government. And then they're like, well, now that you're receiving aid, we have to go police things to make sure that you're not doing things improperly, which leads immediately to them taking children away from their families because the the living standards aren't high enough. Fuck. And these children are taken mm-hmm. and immediately interned in the school for the feeble minded, because obviously these kids can't learn like they wouldn't live out here if they were capable of learning things. So let's take them from right. their loving families and put them in a prison home. Um The purpose of all this was laid out quite clearly in a 1968 article of the Pineland Observer, looking back on this moment. Maine was reputedly a wasteland with pockets of social indigence of low intelligence. It was considered advisable for the good of society that these little settlements be broken up and persons incapable of working moved to a home for them. In 1911. I just don't like it. No, it's not good. It's bad, Margaret. Uh, It's it's real bad. In 1911, a whole home, a whole family was forced out of their home on Malaga for the very first time. The justification was that the father and one of his sons were both terminally ill. So they and all of their younger siblings were forced into a sanitarium at the stroke of a doctor's pen. That year, Malaga was declared by the state government to be part of Phippsburg. They also decided that a wealthy family from that town actually owned the island. Now, this family had never bought Malaga Island. They were the family who had bought Horse Island from the Darlings in 1847 before the Darlings bought Uh Malaga Island. And so basically they were like, well, if they bought Horse Island, they must also own the island that the black people that they they that sold the Uh island to them like bought. Right. It must be their property, Fuck. too. So this family uh-huh. become the owners of Malaga Island, which becomes an excuse for the uh, the local government to send the sheriff in with an order for everyone to vacate. Modern sources agree that this was all extremely illegal, but the Malagaites are going to be evicted without resistance. Um, they're given tiny pittances for their homes and forced on to the mainland. We have but a few precious direct writings from residents at this time. One is from a letter by an islander named Nelson Layton McKinney. Um, And here's, here's what he says about the process of eviction. And this is after he and his family have been forced out. The others of us are having hard times to find homes anywhere on all an account of folks saying we've got the cramp catch in our fingers and take too many things that are lying around loose. But it's all a lie. We don't steal if we are poor. If you know any place where I can crawl in with my wife and five kids and my old peg leg, please let me know. Right. Because of like all of the rumors about how these people are like dangerous tramps who will Uh steal it and it's not laid laid down. Once the the state kicks them out of their home, like they can't find any place to settle. You know, no one will rent to them. No one will like let them, you know, live anywhere because they're they're dangerous. In 1912, the last 45 holdouts on Malaga are evicted by Governor Playstead, who made a big showy visit to the island with media in tow before finishing the eviction. He had himself photographed setting foot on the island like a conquering hero. He and his executive council ordered the eviction of the community after taking eight residents into custody and forcibly institutionalizing them, putting them in a mental institution, right? The justification in most of these cases for like why these people had to be put in an insane asylum was that when questioned, they didn't recognize a phone. Now, this is 1912. Yeah. Uh huh. None of these people were yeah. born in a world with phones, and there are no phones on the island in which they live. But they don't know a phone. Yeah. Put them, lock them up forever in an insane asylum death camp. You know? Yeah. Cool. Which is funny because you could show the same phone to someone born 15 years ago, yeah. and they might not recognize it yeah. either. Things change. Yeah. Like, and it's one of those like I don't know. You know what? Maybe they don't recognize a phone. What I would like to see Governor Place dead. Can you last an entire winter alone on fucking Malaga Island? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, you're dead. Ah, oh, guess yeah. you're not competent to manage your affairs. Anyway. Yeah. You know who's competent to manage all of our affairs, Margaret? Ooh, is it stuff? It is. The products and services that support this podcast are the only people who should be allowed to vote. I think we can all agree on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And we're back. Living in a productocracy. So, Governor Playstead uh, evicts the last people on uh, Malaga Island in 1912. The island is almost immediately sold to a friend and a business partner of the governor's, uh, a guy named Dr. Gustavus Kilgore, who had signed the commitment letters, uh, letters to the institution of all of the evictees. Um, that's cool. Oh, fuck. Not, not fuck. crooked at all. <laughs> They're not at all crooked. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. This isn't a problem that could have all been solved with one well-placed pipe bomb. Um, so good stuff. Good stuff. Other pro photos from the island before its clearing became popular tourist tchotchkes. One infamous set is called the Deuce of Spades and the Tray of Spades, and it shows a black woman sitting inside of a corral holding a small child. The other postcard shows the same woman with two children looking through a fence line. The implication was that the Malagaites kept their children like animals in a pen when it was really like a photo of a family mm -hmm. who kept animals properly on their land that they lived on but like yeah. look they're animals their kids yeah. are in a pin uh, it's it's very frustrating once the state forced everyone yeah. off of Malaga Island, they exhumed the local cemetery and Let's re put them in prison. No, they rebury them on the mainland. Just, yeah, oh, what they, they do, they do put them in oh, prison. Oh, no, they, I'm just saying, hmm? huh? but the kids, they're like, these people keep kids in pens. Yeah, that's fucked up. We better put those kids in a prison <laughs> put them in a crazy people jail, um, which they do. Yeah. Anyway, then, I'm sorry. Then they dig yeah. up all of their dead relatives and bury them uh -huh. at the institution. Like Fuck. they literally imprison the corpses. <laughs> like It is like. I don't know. Maybe there's a degree of like the it's fear next level, the, the fear that like these rich and powerful people always have about folks who don't need them or the society that they've thrived yeah. in about folks who like literally like enthusiastically reject the society in which these people are successful and manage to make a life for themselves is the most frightening thing of all to them. Um, yeah. Anyway, cool stuff. A January 1913 news article celebrated cleaning up Malaga Island. No longer a reproach to the good name of the state. It celebrated that these dispossessed people had been raised to a standard of living they'd probably never dreamed of before. Look, they never dreamed of prisons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before this, none of them had died of cholera in a dank cell. <laughs> Progress! <laughs> Um, they can use a phone once a week. <laughs> yeah, they can see the phone. They're not allowed to use it. <laughs> no one they know has a phone number. <laughs> um, that article in Down East Magazine, uh, The Shameful Story of Malaga from 1980, goes further about kind of mm -hmm. what happens to the these folks after eviction. <clears throat> Except for those sent to the main school for feeble for the feeble minded, no provision had been made for the other islanders. And as the press soon discovered, not only was it costly to support people at the state home, but surrounding towns and refusing pauper status to the displaced islanders denied their right to belong to any community. King McKinney and Jerry Murphy were lucky. They rafted their houses to lots on the mainland at Phippsburg and Meadowbrook. Not so fortunate was Robert Tripp's family, who, having rafted their house up uh, on a hole, sailed up the new Red Meadows River in search of a lot, but were prevented from landing by prosperous Christian people and town authorities. Caught literally between the well-known rock and a hard place, the family hauser, uh, hauzered up some trees on the tiny bush island. They were barely able to eke out an existence and often bordered on starvation. This was acknowledged in a newspaper story of December 1914, the first year of World War I, with a headline reading, Main misery as dark as Belgium's. When Laura, Laura Tripp, formerly strong and healthy, soon became desperately ill, uh, her husband rode three miles for help through the worst gale that has swept the coast in years. But by the time he returned with a doctor, his wife had died. She was later buried in Potter's Field. And probably oh, would be a place mm -hmm. to point out that, like, you know, being evicted increases mortality by an enormous amount, like having all of your stuff yeah. trashed, having like whatever structures you've built trashed increases the risk of mortality. You know, this war on the homelessness in San Diego has been met with a lot of deaths of houseless people. This is what happens anywhere. This kind of shit goes on. And it was happening back yeah. then too. Um, the war on vagrancy continued, even though uh, I, I should know, sorry, Malaga Island remains uninhabited to this day. Um, there are, if you find some modern uh -huh. 
stories about descendants of the Darlings. There's people with last name Darling who like found within the last, mostly within the last like 10 years, the story of their family and like where they, Whoa. like what had happened. There have been some attempts, like there's been like official apologies from local governments in Maine. There have been like some trips that some of these descendants have gotten to take to Malaga Island. There's like been, this is part of why there's, we know what we do now. Like archaeology has been done. People have been studying this. Um, but there are, one of the stories I read, it was, it was with some, you know, this young woman who was like, I never had heard about any of this. And when I brought it up, her dad was like, don't fucking look into this. Like, because there was this, still this fear Whoa. of like, this is dangerous. Like, don't yeah. go digging this shit up. Like, do, do you know what happened to my grandpa? Like, um, it's yeah. fucked up. It's fucked. I mean, it's good that like this has turned a corner and people are talking about this. I don't know. I feel like we should give those people that island. Maybe I don't, I don't know what to do. It's probably yeah, I mean, hard to live on. But it like, was always legally yeah. theirs. Yeah. Like that's the even the like, like, I don't have a ton of respect for um the concept of I'm not a big ownership. property rights right. guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they, it was literally theirs. They literally bought it. They, like they purchased like, <laughs> it with money, with your currency yeah. and owned it. Yeah. And then you were like, now nah, we'll give it to this, to these guys. So this doctor who locks people up can yeah. buy it. Um, cause he's friends yeah. with our fucking dog shit ass governor. Um, yeah. Anyway, cool stuff. Uh, yeah, so that is the story of Malaga Island. Um, it's, you know, tail ends for a while, but the war on vagrancy continues. Um, the laws pioneered in Tennessee and Massachusetts spread over the land, and soon enough, places like California and Florida had their own vagrancy laws. In California, the state declared everyone from wanderers and willfully unemployed people to prostitutes and the lewd guilty of vagrancy. The way the laws were written gave police total power to decide who actually fit the definition of vagrant, and whether or not to take them into custody. This power was used primarily on non-white people, but it was also used on other folks who were disliked by the state, including communists. For example, in 1949, in Los Angeles, Isidore Edelman, a Russian-born communist soapbox speaker, was arrested by the LAPD as he spoke in Pershing Square. Time magazine writes, It was Edelman's strident and offensive speeches that caught the attention of the police. His politics were just too inflammatory for the early Cold War. Twenty years later, in Jacksonville, Florida, Margaret Lorraine Papacristo was arrested while out with her friend, another young blonde woman, and their dates, two black men. Papa Cristo was arrested under a Jacksonville mm. law that made 20 kinds of vagrancy illegal. Time notes that this included rogues and vagabonds or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, <laughs> common railers and brawlers, persons wandering or strolling about from place to place without any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons. I love how often juggling is in these, I love it. <laughs> especially since... Yeah. My, one of my favorite movies is fucking Hot Fuzz, which is about a town whose hatred of, I think it starts with like Roma traveling through town, but of like homeless yeah. people, of like, you know, folks like travelers kind of going through and setting up camps and stuff briefly leads them to like mass murder, like a, b- build a fascist death state where they kill anyone who doesn't abide by the local laws. It's a pretty based movie, but like the old people in it who are like creating this this death state are like one of the things they complain about is the jugglers right like who all get murdered by their 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 junta um pretty cool stuff good movie watch hot fuzz it's about all this actually in a lot of ways um so yeah papa cristo one of the things i found interesting was that she and her friends were found guilty of vagrancy uh for the specific modern crime of what was called prowling by auto which is i think just like hell yeah basically the crime was like she and her friend were white and they were dating black guys and they were driving around yeah. like so that yeah. we gotta crack down on that <laughs> yeah that's not gonna no, fly the, the in the kinds Jacksonville. of laws that make yeah. me angriest are laws that are well racist laws are the most ones that yeah. make me most angry but laws that are just like literally victimless crimes they're laws that like might possibly lead to situations where yeah. other crimes might be more likely or whatever like yeah, well, like no cruising. Like you can't just drive around in circles like, or whatever. This is not, you know, the cruising law, the anti-vagrant law. 
when you kind of look yeah. at the civil rights movement about like the the end of like Jim Crow and shit, this, these are not examples of Jim Crow, right? This anti-vagrancy yeah. law is not a Jim Crow law. It doesn't specify any race, but it gives the police right. to do whatever they want with someone they think is a vagrant. And the cops happen to feel that way anytime they see a black person, right? Like right. that's that's how it works. You know, these are racial laws. Yeah. They're just a little stealthier yeah. than, you know, Jim Crow. James yeah. Crow, as his friends know him, who are bad people. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, uh, what I was going. What, whatever. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. So I'm going to continue with a quote from that Time magazine article talking about vagrancy laws. Between Edelman's arrest and Papa Christo's 20 years later, literally millions of people shared their vagrancy fates. Some of those arrested comported with the usual image of the vagrant. Sam Thompson, for example, was an underemployed handyman and alcoholic arrested some 55 times in Louisville, Kentucky in the 1950s. But many, like Edelman and Papa <laughs> Christo, are more surprising. The police arrested for loitering the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference when he spoke briefly with colleagues on a Birmingham street corner during a 1962 department store boycott. It was vagrancy the police used when they could not get Tulane law student Stephen Wainwright to cooperate with a murder investigation in New Orleans' French Quarter in 1964. It was vagrancy as well that justified the 1966 arrest of, Marsh of Martin Hishhorn, a young cross-dressing hairstylist arrested in his hotel room in Manhattan, wearing only a half-slip and brassiere. Police turned to vagrancy in 1967 when they arrested Joy Kelly in the crash pad she had rented for herself and her hippie friends in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they used it again when they mistook Dorothy Ann Kirkwood for a prostitute when she was on her way to meet her boyfriend on Memphis's famous Beale Street in 1968. These and other vagrancy suspects were white and black, male and female, straight and gay, urban and rural, southern, northern, western, and midwestern. They had money or needed it, defied authority, or tried to comply with it. They were arrested on public streets and in their own homes. As locals are strangers for political protests or seeming like a murderer for their race, their sexuality, their poverty, or their lifestyle. Yeah. Yep. It's fucked up. The state doesn't like it. Yeah. Yep. The state doesn't like when people live outside its logic. It, it does not. And you cops, know. you know, are when you just kind of give them the power to 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 do what they want against the people who they think are doing wrong, they will wind up, yeah. you know, enforcing the kind of laws that the governor of Maine, you know, uh, would have thought were good. You know, you don't have to like write out who they should do violence to, who they should stomp out. You know, they'll they'll get to it on their own. Um, and you know, it was one of those things because of how all pervasive these vagrancy laws were, and one of the things that paragraph i read makes me think about is there's a song i quite like back back from the era before country music was taken over by bootlickers by chris christopherson <laughs> called, the, called the law is for protection of the people and it starts with billy barton a drunk guy you know stumbling around the sidewalk and the bunch of police cars come screaming to the rescue and hollow billy barton off to jail and then there's a hippie dude walking through town and the cops pull him over and like beat him up and shave his hair um and you know it, it, like this goes on like the refrain is because the law is for protection of the people rules are rules and anyone can see you know we don't need no drunks like billy dalton scaring decent folks like you and me and the song kind of builds to um you know <laughs> these lines here so thank your lucky stars you've got protection walk the line and never mind the cost and don't wonder who them lawmen was protecting when they nailed the savior to the cross because the law is for protection <laughs> of the people rules are rules and any fool can see we don't need no riddle speaking prophets scaring decent folk like you and me Chris Christopherson, pretty based guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because of sort of how universal these laws were and how universally they were applied to people on the margins, it became, you know, wrote for folks who lived, you know, in the margins of, of you know, kind of white society to warn their children about these laws. Working class immigrant families would tell their kids, like, do not leave home without you have to have money on you at all times. You can't spend it yeah. like you have to have money because if the police pull you over, you have to be able to prove that you you have money, you know, that otherwise yeah. you can't exist in public. Right. Um, yeah. There were early homo what were called homophile organizations, which are like the first pro gay mm -hmm. organizations. 
organizations, right? That would yeah. educate, uh, you know, their members who were young, gay, lesbian, trans people about lewd vagrancy arrests and that the way to avoid them was, quote, wear at least three items of clothing of your own sex. Um Otherwise, like you would get in trouble. Uh, Black newspapers would tell, you know, people that like, yeah, you like vagrancy arrests, like here's how to avoid doing them. Because like if you if you piss off the cops or just exist in a way that pisses off the cops, like this is what's going to happen to you. Um, Civil rights organizations would publish like vagrancy forms that you could get like filled out that would basically be a thing you carried around that looked official that would say you were a respected member of the community. Um, and this kind of persisted uh, until, yeah, um, the night, you know, 1949 is when this guy Edelman is arrested and he he sues and stuff and he doesn't win his case. But over the next 20 or so years until the early 1970s, uh, reformers and activists uh, repeatedly kind of bring cases against these vagrancy laws. Um, and in the early 1970s, 71 and 72, there are three cases, including Papa Christos, um, that eventually make their way to the Supreme Court, who announces that vagrancy, loitering and suspicious persons persons laws are unconstitutional so that's kind oh, of where we've that. been living since 1972 is this world where these laws that were used to give the police kind of ultimate power to do violence against anyone that um didn't fit in you know uh were not constitutional and now we are seeing them start to return the the authoritarians of our day who are liberal as often as they are conservative are poking at the edges, yeah. seeing what they can get away from, seeing what they can reinstitute, because as we all know, Margaret, the law is for protection of the people. <laughs> <laughs> this is the quote that I come back to all the time is an Anatole France quote. The law and its majestic equality forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal their bread. Yep. You know, it's just like, oh, well, no one's allowed to be homeless. Rich people yeah. and poor people. Yeah. It's um it's cool. It's the same, you know, it's I mean it's it's different, but it's a similar logic. We've got this law that the liberals are trying to pass in Portland to criminalize what they call like domestic terrorist organizing, which is so ill defined mm -hmm. that basically if like anyone ever arms themselves or acts in self-defense as part of a protest, that can be seen as like a terrorist paramilitary organization. And they're like, well, this is because of all the right wing terrorism that we have a huge problem with in Oregon. And it's like, yeah, but you're just handing the cops a thing they can use against anyone they don't like. And who don't the cops like anyone who supports yeah. that law is an idiot. And if your legislator does, you should throw raw eggs at them, um, is my opinion. Uh, my legal opinion and on the First Amendment, raw eggs. Um, I don't like these people. I don't like any of this. <laughs> I'm angry. <laughs> fuck, fuck it. <laughs> um, anyway, you know what's cool is that it turns out the head of intelligence for the Capitol Police was uh, f feeding information to the Proud Boys before January 6th. It's good that the cops oh. can be trusted. Um I love our men in law enforcement supporting the vagrancy laws that uh, were used to institute a police state only for certain people for most of the time that my parents were alive or are alive, have been alive, whatever. My grandparents' whole lives. Yeah. All sorts of cool shit. I don't know. I'm, I'm very angry now, Margaret. I don't know, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go like <laughs> weights or something. <laughs> um yeah no it, it it's just bad and it yeah it still happens in a lot of different ways you know like and obviously it's getting worse again i don't know and none of it makes sense mm -hmm. i mean it only makes sense within a certain logic but it doesn't yeah. make any sense on like a moral level or anything like that yeah throwing eggs at state legislators makes sense to me um you know providing aid and sucker to people who are living you know uh, outside of, you know, what yeah. assholes are comfortable with uh, makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, listening to Chris Christopherson makes sense to me. Also, check out that uh, that state radio song about Benjamin Darling. You know, that's a that's a good one. And that's I, I also think like when we think about what the antidote to this stuff is, it is the kind of radical compassion that Darling exemplified when he chose to save yeah. a person just because they were a person regardless of the wrong that had been done to him 
which is probably why I shouldn't talk so much about throwing eggs at people who annoy me because Benjamin Darling wouldn't do that. But, you know, whatever. I mean, he was maybe. a better person than me. Maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he would have yeah. done that. I shouldn't talk about the other yeah. things that I talk about sometimes when I get angry because <laughs> Benjamin Darling wouldn't have done that. Um, Benjamin Darling. Let's let's all remember that there was a cool dude named Benjamin Darling who rocked. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Margaret, you got anything to plug? Well, if you like cool people who rocked, let me tell you about cool people did cool stuff mm-hmm. where we cover things about like cool people who threw rocks mm-hmm. at fascists. Yeah. Um, like a recent episode. I have literally no idea when this comes out. A recent episode about the cable street Probably next week, the battle for cable street. Mm-hmm. Great. In um, it might be the same week. Who knows mm-hmm. that you can listen to my podcast talking about it. And it actually gets into a bunch of this really similar stuff about how after the fascist party was defeated, in by working class people fighting them the um the state passed a law saying okay no one's allowed to march in uniform anymore and it was directed against the fascists and it was used primarily against the left and against mm-hmm. anti-colonial movements um, you know there's another thing ever changes uh-huh. there's another thought i have based on something you told me about that story which mm-hmm. was that when the fascists came to cable street to attack uh, the Jews, one of the reasons why the anti fascists won is because all of the Irish showed up. And the Irish showed up yeah. because when they had been having a strike earlier and been cracked down on by the state, the Jewish community took their children into their houses to take care of them during the strike, like 20 years earlier. Yep. And so when the Irish yep. heard that there were fascists coming around to threaten the folks who had helped raise them, they were like, well, let's go fuck some shit up. Um, yeah. And maybe, you know, it's a lesson again, back to Benjamin Darling of the sometimes unpredictable value of radical compassion. Uh, yeah totally yeah. yeah so that's my main plug mm-hmm. uh, cool people do cool stuff every Monday and Wednesday on Cool Zone Media and also I kickstarting or have finished kickstarting or whatever a tabletop role playing game called Penumbra City that gets into if you want to play this kind of thing this life this living outside the system etc is a really mm-hmm. good game for you and that's what I got yeah um, well, let's uh, let's all check out that uh, spend some time in Penumbra City uh, before it is it is attacked by whatever that governor's name of Maine, you know, or maybe make him <laughs> your bad guy. If you want to run a campaign, governor placed it, you know, there's a there's a yeah. fucking monster name for you right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I might do that. <laughs> yeah. Let's burn him in effigy in our role playing yeah. games. Um, well, yeah. You can listen to this podcast and Margaret's podcast and a variety of other excellent podcasts like Hood Politics by our friend Prop uh, for without ads. If you pay a small amount of money by getting on Apple and signing up for Cooler Zone Media where you'll get all of our stuff ad free Cooler Zone Media on Apple. There will be an Android version soon. We are working on it. Sophie's working on it. I'm doing nothing at all. Um, I don't care about any of you Android users. I'm an Android user, but I don't care about you. Sophie does, and she is taking care of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, I didn't care about the Apple people. Sophie did all the work on that, too. So thank thank you, Sophie. (laughs) (laughs) And and our friend friend Jake Handran has a new show on Cool Zone Media, Mm -hmm. Robert. What's it called? He does. He does. It's called Sad Oligarch, and it's about all those Russian oligarchs who strangely died the exact same way by falling out of windows at high heights. Anyway, check all that out. Cooler Zone Media, Apple whatever. Bye! Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.